video yesterday and it was analyzing a girl that's in South Africa who's extremely poor and then we were looking at another girl whose family is wealthy. What are the main differences that we saw? Yeah. So differences in housing. You mentioned the wealthy live pretty similar to how a lot of Americans live. So one girl that showed, we argued that she actually lived better than a lot of Americans live. She had a really big house, she had a pool, she went to a really nice private school. So she lives better than probably the average American. Where on the contrast, the girl who was living in the hut, her dad isn't in her life, her mom's dying in the hospital of AIDS. You remember how often she ate? One meal. No, one meal. Every night. Every night. Okay, it showed her eating like one meal towards the end of the day after she had gone to school. Horrible. So that meal looked horrible? Probably tastes good when you're starving, but yeah, it doesn't look like the most appetizing. I would rather eat cereal. <laughs> so that, uh, I don't know about that. So that brings, up, that brings up the question, what is the main reason then that there's so much crime? How are inequality and crime linked? Yeah. Okay. All right. So lack of lack of cops. Yeah. Awesome. Also, because the people who are super poor, in order to live or survive, they need to steal. Like a bunch of them steal food and stuff. So I guess that's why they crime is because people are like stealing food. Yeah. If you are starving, your survival instincts kick in, and your main question is not, "Oh well, is this mine?" The main question in your mind is, "Like, I'm gonna." Am I going to die if I don't eat something soon? That's what happens in candy. So, those people, they are able to, they justify it in their minds saying, well, I have nothing, these people have so much, like that's, like, I have to live, or this is what I have to do. Okay, the next question, what is uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren's plan for student debt in the country? Talked about this yesterday, yeah. I'm not sure the exact number, somewhere around like three hundred and sixty-five like billion dollars. So like I don't know. Like and if two percent comes from like the wealthy and stuff, people have to make them over a certain amount of money in order to pay off student loans. Okay, so families that have over fifty million in wealth, they will be paying an extra like two percent on a yearly tax. That will go towards helping people have loan forgiveness. So you can get up to $50,000 loan forgiveness only if you do not make 100,000 per year. So that means that a doctor <coughs> coming right out of school, they're often, like when they're done with residency, they're often making more than that amount and they might be 300 grand in debt. Maybe 250 to 300 grand, depending on the school they went to. <coughs> Under her system, they would not get loan forgiveness. Yeah. Wait, so if you're less successful, then you would get loan forgi forgiveness, but then if you like go and major in all that and you're making more, then you don't get it? Mm, I mean, if you want to talk terms of success, some individuals would argue that the amount of money you make doesn't necessarily indicate success. For example, you can have someone that starts a multi-level marketing company, makes ridiculous amounts of money, but they are taking advantage of uneducated people. <coughs> On the other hand, you could have someone working for a nonprofit making 60 grand a year that's extremely well educated. They're having a good impact in the world, but they're not making as much money. So, to go off that idea, yeah, though, the idea is if you are making over 100,000 per year, you would not get loan forgiveness. But if you're making less than that, then you could get loan forgiveness. Up to 50,000 at least. If someone is 300,000 in debt and they're not making 100 grand a year, they'll get 50 uh, grand taken off of that. But they're not going to get any more than that $50,000. Okay, thoughts or questions with that? Let's go on to some current events. Does anyone know of any current events you'd like to share? Yeah. President Trump held like a big, this was a few days ago, held like a big Easter hunt. Kids, 
Sarah Sanders wasn't thrown around looking for Easter eggs and some of the people that weren't there. highlighting again in those who talk about these attacks for days. Looks like there's actually now 359 people that they counted before. It was around 200, now 359. Highlights that there were officials in Sri Lanka that were warned, but they didn't like follow the warning. They didn't heed the warning. In American politics, the few things that we want to really look at here. So ever since the Mueller report has been released, there have been a few people that have been subpoenaed by Congress. There was one that was the security director. And Trump is saying he doesn't want his current or former aides testifying before Congress because Democrats control the congressional committees right now. So he claims that it's not necessary. Now other individuals, some legal analysts, some legal scholars, they're saying that this is a constitutional crisis because that's how it's supposed to be as Congress has people come in and testify, and they testify regardless of anyone's political party. Now, 2010 to 2000, was it 2010 to 2018, when Republicans dominated Congress, they would call Democrats in to testify all the time, and the Democrats would go in and testify. Historically, that's how it's been. The House of Representatives always has a majority of one party, and then that party all people in to testify that sometimes are not in that party. But it hasn't really been a problem, but now Trump is telling his former White House aides, his current White House aides, to not go in and testify. Any thoughts on this? What was that? You shouldn't have testified. Because they're the ones that are where Trump is. Would, you say who would testify? Yeah. Okay. What are they testifying about? Well, so there was a security director, there was an article about how, um, on KSL, how there were individuals given security clearance when like, their backgrounds indicated that maybe they shouldn't have been, and Congress was having them come in to testify, and he just didn't show up. Trump told him not to go, and he just didn't. But I didn't really get that about like, security. Well, I'll show you in the article in a second. But again, one of the dangerous things, though, this could set a precedence in the future. Like even if, let's say, Republicans have the House in the future and they invite Democrats to come in and testify. If this is allowed and this happens now, the Democrats in the future could say, oh, we're not gonna go in and testify. Because back in 2019, 2020, uh, Trump's, people in the Trump administration were not coming in. They said it was partisan. Well, we say it's partisan now, so we don't have to. This could be something going into the future that could lead to a constitutional crisis where procedures are not being followed the way that they were designed to be followed. On that topic as well, uh, Trump's tax returns have been requested by Congress and we had the Treasury of the Secretary, Stephen Mnuchin, didn't meet that deadline supposed to be due yesterday. They didn't meet that deadline and said, oh, we'll decide by May 6th. <coughs> so, just indicating like that similar idea, um, like the danger of people not going into Congress, not getting the documents that Congress is asking for. Okay, Joe Biden is expected to announce his presidential race tomorrow. We remember what Joe Biden was accused of. Being a creepy pervert. Being a creepy? Mm -hmm. uh, not assault. I don't, I don't believe assault. More just like making, there were accounts that he made women feel uncomfortable because he like hugged them and. Kissed their hair. Yeah, there's one where he like kissed someone's like back of someone's head. People highlight, some people highlight, he does that to children, he does that to men. But others are saying, well, he needs to cut that behavior out. He's not, not able to do anything for president because of that. I wanted to show you this uh, malaria vaccination, like, kind of groundbreaking thing that had happened.
having children in Africa getting the first malaria vaccinations in the world. And so right now, we have 360,000 kids getting to get a pilot for the disease, so 435,000 people each year. So the World Health Organization, they've indicated that the uh, trial show the vaccine could prevent a lot of cases of malaria. So we'll be going into malaria and AIDS in the next few days as we're looking at the healthcare crisis that exists on the African continent right now. I wanted to show this article to local news at Salt Lake. Protesters and people um, were rallying, and they, I believe they showed up at a Salt Lake City Council meeting to testify or house it in the city. So they argue that there's not enough affordable housing. Some people take it a step further. The person who organized the event, uh, someone that I know, his name's Cristobal. Uh, this person was at one point. Um, Chris Paul, someone that I disagree with on some issues. At one point, he was the secretary of the Democratic Party, <coughs> and then he resigned and said that uh, there were people being racist towards him. But one thing Chris Paul said, and reading, he said, "We're here to make sure Salt Lake City and the and the elected and the people who make money off the people who's trying to live." to make sure that they know that we're here, we're organized, we're getting energized. At the end of the day, housing is a human right. Now let's break that down. Housing is a human right. Any thoughts on what that actually means? First off, what is a human right? Yeah, Austin, awesome. what were you gonna say? Isn't this a human right sort of like something that a human should have? Okay. Something that a sh human should have just because they exist, just because they're born. So the human rights that a lot of like the founding fathers believed in are things in the Constitution, things like uh, freedom of speech. People should be able to generally say what they want as long as they're not hurting anyone else, as long as they're not causing like physical harm to anyone else or inciting violence against a specific person. And they should be able to have freedom of speech, freedom of religion, as long as your religious beliefs don't harm anyone else. You should be able to be free to believe what you want. Those are the types of things that people say are basic human rights. Some individuals would advocate like education as a human right. Like kids should be educated because if they're not really well educated, it's hard for them to make any legitimate decisions. But the idea that housing is a human right, perhaps someone can make that argument. When I say education, I mean more like K through 12. I'm not saying college. Some people advocate like K through 12, like young kids should be able to go to school. The idea that housing is a human right. Some people might say, well, for kids, yeah, that's legitimate. Kids should be guaranteed to have a roof over their heads even if their parents are sloping up, even if their parents are unable to provide them with a home. They should have some kind of roof over their head. But the idea that housing is a human right for adults, what that literally means is that it's society's job or society's role to provide Every single person with a roof over their head, regardless. It doesn't say housing is a human right if someone is willing to work, which someone could argue maybe affordable housing, like as long as they're willing to work full time, they should be able to have some kind of roof over their head. He's saying housing is a human right, which would indicate the homeless people in Salt Lake, some of which have mental illness, that okay, hopefully get a medication so they can work and do something. But there's others that are drug addicts that are shooting up heroin, they have needles in their arms all the time. He would imply then that no, it's the rest of society's responsibility to make sure that every single one of those people have a roof over their head. People that refuse to work, which there are some homeless people that just straight up refuse to work. He would say, no, it is society's responsibility to make sure every single one of those people have a roof over their head. That is what he means when he says at the end of the day, housing is a human right. So that begs the question, like, is that a legitimate human right? Does everyone have the right, just by existing, to have a roof over their head? Thoughts on this? No? 
Some people might argue, well, if someone served in the military, let's say they have PTSD from things they saw, that might be another story. If the PTSD makes it so they have a really hard time working or if they're disabled. But if someone just refuses to work, they just don't want to work, the idea that everyone else needs to chip in so that they can have a roof over their head, that can be considered problematic. If you have a book out, go ahead and put it away. If you have phones or AirPods as well. this guy, Carl Klein, so he was, a, he was a security director, he was something about a Democrat, and he didn't show up for the meetings. And so they subpoenaed him after one of his former like workers, told the panel that dozens of people in Trump's administration were granted security clearances despite disqualifying issues in the background. And so because of that, Congress was wanting him to go and testify and say, why did you give these people security clearances when you shouldn't have? And he just didn't show up in the meeting. Any thoughts or questions on this? Okay, go ahead and pull out your notes. We're gonna keep watching the apartheid video, and I will call you up to show me your notes. Not just the notes from the video, but the notes from just like all of Africa that you've been taking.